Hello and Hello. welcome everyone. You've arrived at Cyverse's Focus Forum webinar series. I'm Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer. Today's presentation is titled Fall in Love with High Performance Computing at Cyverse, presented by John Fawner, who's based at the Texas Advanced Computing Center at UT Austin and manages the Emerging Technologies team within their Life Sciences Computing Group. John's team at TAC developed and maintained the Cyber Science APIs and Software Development Kit, which allow users to programmatically access Cyber's platform services. For those of you unfamiliar with Cyber, we are an NSF-funded cyber infrastructure project. This free webinar series is designed to fulfill a key part of our mission, which is to train scientists on how to use Cyber's computational resources. Um, I'm going to tackle some housekeeping really quickly, and then we'll start the webinar. Today's presentation is roughly 30 minutes with time for Q&A at the end. Please be sure to open the chat window and type your questions for, uh, for John there and I'll read them at the end. Materials from today's webinar, such as his slides and a video recording will be posted on the website uh, events page for this webinar. Uh, next week we are offering, we are starting our second FOSS camp. FOSS stands for Foundational Open Science Skills. And uh, that's a week long intensive uh, on open science and open source compute resources for newly minted PIs and others to kickstart their labs and funded research. And following that in March, we'll do our third container camp, which John will uh, talk about a little bit later. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Fawner, our Cyvers colleague at TAC, who has been an absolute sweetheart for agreeing to use my corny webinar title. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, uh, pleasure to be here and have a chance to talk with you all today. I've embedded a couple of parts in my slides to, to honor the Valentine's Day theme. Uh, great, so uh, as, as Tina said, uh, I'll talk to you a lot today about high performance computing, how Cyverse is leveraging high performance computing um, to make it easier for people to get the research resources they need, computing resources they need for their research. So I wanted to start the talk with kind of um, anchoring it on the vision of what Cyverse desires to do, and that is to transform science through data-driven discovery. And key ingredients to make that possible are the tools, training, and the compute resources that are uh, represented in the cyber infrastructure that, that Cyverse has built. And uh, my passion very much involves improving the accessibility, scalability, reproducibility, and automation. I think automation sometimes isn't highlighted as much in the research that people do. So I want to kind of preface that. I'll talk more about the cyber infrastructure on the next slide, and then we'll, we'll talk about um, performance computing. So this is a kind of a traditional layer cake view of how people build cyber infrastructure. And at the very bottom level is the underlying hardware resources. So these are things like um, you know, actual hard drives to, to store data, databases to, to track information, um, high-performance computing resources, which is a lot of what we do here at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, as well as cloud systems, which we do here as well. And so these make up the underlying resources. Uh, these are very powerful. Um, you, could, you, know, you could argue this is kind of the core ingredient to make a lot of the compute capability possible. And, uh, you know, it's also very flexible to use, but the ease of use is not very high. And the way that people can take the analysis that they're doing and share it with others um, is very manual if you just directly use hardware resources. So at Cyverse, we have this whole service layer that sits on top of the hardware resources. And uh, these are not necessarily direct user-facing interfaces. These are sort of the tools and the, and the software um, that serves as glue between the underlying hardware resources and the products that um, are user-facing resources. They handle things like um, data movement. So if you use the data store, underneath the hood, that's an IRODS file system. And it is replicated between the University of Arizona and between TAC. We have a copy here in our data center. And all that work of keeping data synced between the two locations is done using IRODS and, and things like that. Um, you'll see a lot of these have to do with um, authentication, Others have to do with you know, orchestration of, of cloud jobs or of HPC jobs. Uh, but these are, these are things that users generally don't see but are key in building up infrastructure. Uh, at the top level are these products that 
hopefully most of you are familiar with. So the discovery environment is a really nice web portal based user interface uh, to let a whole lot of users do analysis on a wide range of tools and be able to share both the analysis process with others as well as, well as the underlying data and the results that they get. Um, and so this is intended to be a very uh, accessible way and reproducible way of not only doing analysis, but uh, collaborating with others on that analysis. And there are others, you'll notice one of these is the science APIs. Um, this arguably could be in the service layer, um, and I'll talk about APIs. APIs are inherently kind of a, a, an interface for other machines and not for humans. Um, but there are, there's tooling that is built around these science APIs, which really does make them a, a, a top level entity and product that's designed for um, those who are developing software tools or who are doing uh, science at scale and, and want more control over their workflows and, uh, and automation. So the science APIs are actually consumed by the discovery environment and by a lot of powered by Cyverse sites. Okay, so with that context, a lot of this will be focused on science APIs and then, and then hardware resources. Um, I'm actually gonna start here at the bottom, so to show you the, the resources that are available uh, at Cyverse. So data storage, the Cyverse data store is really a, a one-stop shop for um, data. Uh, we found not only in the Cyverse project, but in lots of projects, that having data centrally located, uh, where it can be shared with others uh, in a very you know, granular and controlled way, having private data, having community data, and having kind of this intermediate where data is only shared between a few specific people, is really powerful for science. Um, this is a, a key thing. Uh, it's very difficult to get this type of capability in the commercial cloud, but we think it's very important. So it's it's a kind of a core resource that we provide with the community. Um, high throughput computing, meaning kind of quick turnaround times for compute jobs that don't have significant resource requirements that are associated with them. Most of those jobs run on a cluster that's at the University of Arizona that's dedicated to cybers. So if you use the discovery environment, and I'll show a screenshot and a couple of slides, then a lot of those jobs are going to be running at, the, at a dedicated cluster there. If you need cloud computing resources, and I know one of the, the questions we got in the survey was, <clears throat> you know, how do I, what are resources for persistent services or web-based services? Uh, Cyverse has Atmosphere, which is a kind of a virtual machine. It's a cloud resource where you can launch virtual machines um, that give you a, a, a graphical user interface for doing various types of data exploration. Uh, Jetstream is the other one that's worth mentioning, uh, which is a, resource that is here and at the University of Illinois that is a cloud resource and also not a bad spot to host a persistent web service um, if you need that, if you need virtual machines. High performance computing is really intended to capture work that requires, um, you know, a significant amount of, of compute resources. It doesn't have to be more than one node. Uh, these days, even a single node of a HPC cluster can get a lot of work done, um, but anything that requires you know a few hours on multiple cores and up uh, is is amenable to a high performance computing paradigm. We have a lot of them at TAC, which I'll talk about. Um, they are accessible via TAC directly, via Exceed, which is the National Science Foundation's discovery environment, and also available directly through Cyverse using Tapis, the, the TAC APIs which I will also talk about. And finally, the other little piece of infrastructure that we have at Cyverse, which I think is less used, uh, but extremely powerful, is functions as a service. And the, the focus of functions as a service is in automation. And I will talk about that as well. Toward the end. But that's available directly through Cyverse. OK, um, so you'll see that, that I've, you know, most of the text here is blue. When you sign up for a Cyverse account, most of the things I'm going to talk about, you have access to. For the direct you know, command line, high performance computing resources, um, some of those are also allocated via attack directly and some through Exceed. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that we are bridging authentication layers in a way with the infrastructure. Uh, but hopefully that'll make sense as we go on. Okay, so what is the Texas Advanced Computing 
partner. Um, we are a group of five staff members. Uh, a little under half of us are PhDs. Um, we engage with students and, and interns regularly as well. Um, but a lot of us are long timers here at TAC. So one in three of the staff here has been at TAC for over 10 years. Um, so it's a great place to work. I walk down the hall and I'm in life sciences computing, which is kind of our one domain specific area. But I can walk and, and pass people who are very passionate about lots of different things, be it you know, Fortran programming or understanding exactly how memory registers work and new CPU architectures and things like that. And so we end up having this kind of big Venn diagram of, of skill sets that overlap, um, all with the objective of providing a, a comprehensive ecosystem of compute uh, resources for science. Uh, we do run the, the big systems, the big iron. Um, that's actually a minority of, of staff that, that uh, operate the, the clusters themselves. A lot of what we do is around software development, uh, around research for future computing. Um, we do a lot of user support, a lot of consulting, and a lot of training um, to help people use the resources that are available to them. So we have over 50 open source uh, software projects. If you go to the TAC GitHub, we have a number of GitHub organizations, but you'll see it's full of things. Um, we get our funding not from direct users. I know another one of the questions is, how much does it cost to use high-performance computing resources? And generally, the answer is zero for the end user. Uh, TAC is funded by grants, some through the National Science Foundation, some through other federal funding agencies, some at the state level and the university level. So most of the, the ways that we are able to serve the community uh, is, is, um, is not by charging users. Uh, we provide things to users for free. It's a meritocracy that way. And the funding is provided through the, 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 the grant organizations like NSF, like the uh, Cybers Project. We do lots of training here uh, as well as, as, as through Cybers. Um, we do it at TAC as well. And we also do a lot of outreach to both graduate students, undergraduate students, and K through 12 students uh, to hopefully encourage them to you know, explore the computer science and, and research in general. So that's kind of what TAC is. That's, um, that's the people around me here in the room that I'm in. As far as hardware that we run, uh, I can kind of organize it around capabilities. Uh, so the largest system that we have here is Frontera. It's the largest open science system. It's number five in the world currently. Um, it's a 38 petaflop system. Um, they're running Intel processors. There's 56 cores per node, 190, uh, 192 gigs of memory per node. And it is really designed to be a, a leadership class HPC system. Um, it's the, the National Science Foundation funded it, and the users who are on that system apply for time via the National Science Foundation. There's a kind of a leadership computing application process. Um, I didn't mention on the slide, but there's also a, a GPU component to Frontera. Um, there's almost 200 GPU nodes. Uh, half of them are um, four GPUs per node of, uh, well, it's, it's really the Longhorn spec. It's the NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs. And then the other half is uh, an RTX 5000 GPUs. So I know there's some people that are doing machine learning and um, these systems have tons of GPU capability that's really designed for that. Stampede 2 is one that a lot of cybers jobs run on. That's an 18 petaflop system. It's also Intel based, so there's Skylake nodes. Uh, they have 48 cores per node and 192 gigs of memory. And there are also Knight's Landing nodes. Those are uh, one of the Intel mini core architectures. And so those have 68 cores, more cores per node, but 96 gigs of memory, so a little bit less memory. And Stampede is also built for kind of a uh, CPU bound typical HPC problems. Um, you know, the median job, just to kind of dispel the myth of that all HPC jobs are these really huge things that take a long time to run and use thousands of cores. You know, the median job on Stampede 2 is one node. So most people use one node. And most software, especially in the life sciences space, uh, does not use MPI, the message passing interface that is required to operate across multiple nodes. So uh, if, if the code just uses threading, which again is representative of a lot of the bioinformatics community, then we run a lot of single node jobs on Stampede 2, and it still provides a ton of value. 
just because each node is, is so big. Lone Star 5 is another resource that you guys, if you're using the discovery environment and run HPC apps, may be using behind the scenes. Uh, that's a two petaflop system, and um, it is funded through uh, mostly through the University of Texas system. And so it's not funded through the National Science Foundation, which lets us allocate it a little bit differently. Uh, but it's still very much a meritocracy, uh, very much, you know, people, people apply, and if, if they're in you know, Texas-based research organization, and, and they get time on the system for free because it's funded by, uh, by those institutions themselves. And that system has uh, 24 cores per node. It's a Cray system uh, and 64 gigs of RAM. Um, it's about four years old, so the numbers and core count memory are just a little bit smaller. But it's still a great workhorse. The queue times are a little bit shorter, so we can use it for high throughput computing as well. Uh, Longhorn, I mentioned. Uh, Longhorn is a, a really powerful GPU cluster. Uh, I think it by itself, it's, it's only 108 nodes, but um, I think it's the 120th most powerful system in the world. So it's, it's still pretty big. Uh, and it's very much focused on machine learning. Uh, we have a lot of people running like molecular dynamics on there. Um, and then there's actually a, a Bowtie 2 implementation that's GPU based, which is pretty cool. And some other things that are going on. there. So that's on Longhorn. I mentioned Jetstream, we have cloud resources. And then the rest of these are really around data storage, which honestly, we, we do a lot of data marshaling behind the scenes through our APIs to support TAC users. Um, and we have data storage here that's available for people, but I don't know how, how much it needs to be highlighted given that the data store is such a powerful tool. So I know some were very interested in the, the tech specs of these different systems. Hopefully kind of the, the description I've given will Will state some of that desire. Uh, if not, the user guides, which I've linked down below, uh, have all the tech specs and all the node counts and things like that um, to really talk about how everything is laid out. So there are lots of resources. How are these resources um, allocated? How can you get access for them? So you already have access to them quite a bit for specific apps if you use the discovery environment or you use the science APIs directly. So there are over 300 public apps in the HPC. So if you go into the discovery environment, you click on the HPC tab. Most of these are running at TAC on either Stampede 2 or Lone Star 5. Or if you are just looking by topic, there's a category over to the right. And anything that says Agave, which is, uh, we call it Tapas now, but it's the API layer. Um, anything that's, that's via that API layer is probably running at TAC as well. Uh, there's some other people, other other groups that have integrated their own clusters to run apps as well, but most of those I don't think are public. I think all the public ones are attacked. So there are over 300 public ones. There's about 1,500 um, apps total if you include the private ones, another 1,200 private apps uh, that are all using the APIs and that are, are using TAC or some other resource behind the scenes. So um, these apps are not things that are built for the most part by, uh, some of them are, but 300 plus, most of them are not built by cyber staff. Uh, there are developers that are uh, either community members like those on the call, parts of other projects that are powered by cybers um, that are developing these apps and publishing them and making them available for the community. So I just can't emphasize enough what a, uh, a powerful service that is to the community and, and we love our developer community. We try and support them everywhere we can. So if there is something that you want to do on a high performance computer that is not included in the existing app, you can always request an app. Um, and, and if it's possible, you know, that means that's something that can, can be deployed. Or you can go directly to the HPC itself and use it there. Um, again, on my little cake diagram, if I go back, there's sort of, as you dive down from the discovery environment and start using hardware directly, you get more flexibility in what you do, uh, but there's just more of a learning curve. So Stampede 2 and Jetstream are available through Exceed. Uh, if you are a US-based researcher or a collaborator of a US-based researcher, this is a great way to get a lot of computing time. Startup allocations on Exceed are very easy to get. You just kind of need to give an abstract of the, the scientific use case that, that you're using and request hours on the system. Uh, it doesn't take too long and they process those and make sure that everything sounds okay, and then they give you some time on the system. And from there, if you outgrow kind of a startup allocation and want 
you know, millions of, of CPU hours, they do that uh, through research, uh, research allocations. And those are a little bit more involved to apply for. Uh, there are you know, three pages or so to talk not only about what you want to do, but they give some, you need to give some scaling information just to show, to demonstrate that you can take full advantage of the resources that you're asking for. Uh, and, and they award those as well. So that is a great way for any US-based researcher to get a lot of compute time uh, on any of the, the systems, Stampede 2, Jetstream, and Attack, and there are other systems uh, at other institutions as well that you can have access to. If you are a Texas-based researcher, most likely you can log on to the TAC user portal and request an allocation that way. So um, Texas-based researchers can have access to Stampede 2, uh, the Lone Star, the Wrangler, which I didn't mention, it's a uh, data intensive computing type system, uh, and, and a lot of other systems as well, directly through the TAC user portal. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind if you're using it. All right, but what do you get? If you, if you go directly and sign, some, sign up for this, then by default you get direct command line access. And I think for some users, for advanced users, uh, this will look comfortable. A command line is a very expressive interface. It's a very powerful interface, but it has a very steep learning curve. And it doesn't give you much guidance on what you should do next when you are just presented with a command prompt. Uh, you have to learn how to submit jobs. And you have to know how to script up the, the types of calculations that you want run to invoke the app and things like that. So if, uh, if you are an advanced user or if you are a developer, if you feel like you know, contributing to software is going to be part of, of what you do for your, your research product, uh, then this is definitely the way to go. I mean, the, the command line has been a common denominator for scientific computing for many decades, and it probably won't change a whole lot in the future. Um, you know, the, the bleeding edge interface for a new piece of code is the command line. So bleeding edge researchers will ultimately end up using the command line, um, no matter how much projects like Cybers try and paper over it. So if that's you, then there are a lot of resources that are available for you to, to kind of shorten the learning curve. Uh, TAC has a learning site with some tutorials. You can look for anything that says you know, new user or introduction, uh, and there's a lot of topics there. We also have on our portal, um, and I'll, I'll link this again later, you know, user guides and, and things like that. Uh, on how to use our system specifically with examples. So that is the underlying hardware resources. And um, I kind of want to talk about the science APIs for a while and how we take some of these underlying resources and abstract away the command line so that people that are discovering using the discovery environment don't need to know how to use the Linux command line, but they can still run apps at scale. So one of the key ingredients here are what we call science APIs. Um, the uh, TAPIS, kind of the, the TAC APIs is, is a, a core piece of this. Um, there are some APIs for the discovery environment that are accessible as well. So TAPIS is not the only piece of the science APIs, but it is the piece that integrates with high performance computing. And so I'll focus on it today. Um, TAPIS has been known by other names. So we used to call a lot of our HPC oriented APIs Agave. And then we had other functions as a service stuff called Abaco. And we had other ideas of APIs to build and we decided we should stop making people memorize different names for every time we release a new API and we just thought we'd call them all TAPIS, uh, TAC APIs. So what is an API? An API, it, it literally stands for Application Programming Interface, uh, which ironically conveys very little additional information. Um, an API is supposed to be a way to send a formatted message in a very consistent way that returns a very consistent output. And that makes it a building block that, that you can code against. So uh, machines can communicate with other machines using APIs. Um, if you're wondering how you can you know, log into Facebook using your Google credentials, Google has an API that, uh, for its authentication services. Um, if you're wondering, you know, how uh, there are all these integrations with GitHub or with um, GitHub integrates with other services like Travis CI and things like that or Docker. Um, all these are available because of these APIs. So they're, they are intended to be machine readable as a first class thing, but uh, at least for these, humans can mostly read and understand what they're doing as well. 
And so it becomes a, a building block that we humans use to, to automate, scale out, and share the work that we do. So the science APIs also serve as a bridge. So if you notice, when you log in to TAC, you need to log in using the TAC credentials. Um, if you log in to Cybers, to the discovery environment, you're going to be using a, a Cybers username and password. So those are not the same. Uh, but, but Tapas has built in it this concept of systems and apps and jobs where you can register a system and, and define a separate set of credentials to use to be able to access it. Uh, and that lets us take the cybers infrastructure and to reach out to other third party organizations uh, to be able to do very specific tasks on behalf of the user. So it's, it's, it's federation um, is another way to say it. Uh, but not only does it mean that cybers can work seamlessly with TAC resources, it actually means that cybers can work with any third party resource if it's accessible via SSH or some of the other common uh, protocols. So if you have a cluster at your own university or within your own lab and you want uh, your lab members to be able to run apps within the discovery environment that actually execute on your own cluster, uh, you can do that. And there are other groups that have done that. I've, I've personally helped groups where they were working on a software piece that was part of a workflow and they wanted to integrate it into the existing infrastructure uh, at Cybers. Um, and it was fun. It's not, it's not a too difficult thing to do. Uh, it's what we've done here at TAC, though. It's how Cybers integrates with our HPC and our storage. Uh, and, and it can be done for other sites as well. So apps are kind of the, one of the common currencies there. There's a lot of other APIs that I could talk about. But, um, you know, people who develop and deploy apps, uh, they can run on a specific set of hardware and they can be made available to, to lots of people, even if they don't have a tag allocation or a exceed allocation. And then the last thing I'll, I'll talk about are functions as a service. Um, I have one more slide on this, so I'll, I'll go into it there. But um, this is another kind of computing paradigm that, that I think is really powerful. If you want to learn more about Tapas, uh, there's the site below, it's kind of the intro page. A lot of our documentation is on um, Weebly Box, and I've got a slide for that. So if you are looking uh, to use HPC resources for an app, and it's something that you want to share, then we have some guides and resources for people who are building custom apps. And essentially what it takes to, to take an application and register it in the discovery environment is usually a container, um, I'll start with number two, uh, a Docker or singularity image that has the code and the, the dependencies that you want to run. If you don't know what a container is, I'll get to that toward the end as well. This doesn't have to be a container. Uh, it could be just an executable that's compiled for whatever system it's running on. Um, but you know, the, the recommended workflow is definitely to containerize first. And then you have a script. This could be a two-line bash script that can take all your input parameters and correctly invoke the command line that needs to be run to, uh, to run your app. So this, this kind of prerequisite here is that you are a developer, you are, you are someone who's familiar enough with the app to be able to invoke it on the command line. And then finally, there is a, an app bundle that has um, included in it a, uh, a definition for what all the inputs are that need to go into the app. And that is sort of the uh, contract that says, um, if someone wants to use this app, they need to provide this set of inputs and parameters and then the code will go and execute those and return the results. And really, all for all the 300 plus apps that are available through HPC systems, um, this is what they're composed of. <coughs> and uh, it's, it's quite accessible. Uh, again, you need some command line uh, know-how, but it's quite accessible to go in and, and build your own custom app if you know about the app, register it with Cybers, and then you'll see it just appear within the discovery environment. The other piece is this functions as a service platform that I wanted to highlight. Um, we call these actors. Uh, an actor is actually a specific computer science term for a model of kind of this single unit of computing. And actors can uh, call other actors. They can do work themselves. They can even recurse themselves you know, to do small things. And we have this service deployed 
for use cases where you need to do some small piece of computing. So this is not something that would be high performance computing, uh, but this is part of the science APIs. And um, it, it is either a, a task for automation. So every time a file is uploaded to a certain directory, I want to go do some small pre-processing on it to standardize the format, uh, or check for errors or, or something like that. And an actor is a great tool for that. Um, you can start to build up pipelines even if you want to, have actors calling other actors, and, uh, make decisions and, and take a branch and path down a pipeline. Um, actors can call other Tapas apps or other third-party services. So if you want to get a Slack notification whenever something happens, uh, that's something you can do inside of an actor. Have it receive a message and then you can tell it how to communicate with Slack. And so this is sort of an, an infrastructure piece. So HPC is, is great, uh, but within the research, daily research workflow, uh, there comes times where you don't want to do everything by hand. And so Abaca, uh, act, Actors, um, as part of the TAPAS API, is uh, a way to automate those little pieces. Um, so these actors are containers um, that you can define. They receive messages. And based on that message, they'll take some sort of action, and you can see what they did by looking at their logs. So it's a very simple API, but very powerful. We've done a lot of different things with it. So just wanted you to know that's out there. Okay, and here's my page of links. Uh, this is kind of a description of where everything is located. So uh, there's a command line interface for interacting with all the, state, the science APIs that is on GitHub. Uh, we're currently, this is a, a new version. We had one based on Bash that we are retiring. Uh, this one is all on, on Python. Uh, so it's, it's been good to us thus far. We're on Alpha 3. Most of the capabilities are in there. Um, if you're just getting started with building apps, then this is definitely the one that I would recommend using. We have lots of documentation on Read the Docs, both about the command line tools themselves, as well as the underlying APIs. And finally, there is a Slack community it's very active on using the science APIs, both with Cybers and with other projects. So if this is something that interests you, uh, I, I recommend that you join Tapas. This will send you the Slack invites that you can log into the Slack community there and meet other developers uh, as well. I'm on that community as well as others attack. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to talk about, we've talked about HPC resources, talked about APIs that connect those underlying resources to Cyber so that they're available inside of the discovery environment and other interfaces. And I've mentioned as we've been talking about this that when it comes down to it, most of the code that runs on these HPC systems either is or it should be inside of containers. So containers, just to end this talk as a public service announcement, uh, I think is a, a critical fundamental building block for scientific computing. Uh, containers were intended for web apps to improve uptime uh, and to help in deployment uh, and version control and things like that. Uh, science has stolen them because they are great for reproducibility uh, and portability. And, and to some extent, if they're paired correctly with things like version control and, and other tools like in uh, the databases and cybers, they're great for provenance as well. So if you are someone who writes any code to do analysis uh, and intends to, to publish that and make it available to others. Um, I hope you're using containers as a building block for doing that. Uh, we at TAC, we have a mirror, mostly a mirror, a filtered mirror of the entire biocontainers project. So it's, if it's almost 5,000 containers that, that we run here. Um, there's technically 15,000 containers in the repository. But, um, some of those aren't exactly executable, so we filter. Um, but all those containers are at TAC. Um, they're integrated into our module system so that if you're using, if you need Bowtie 2, um, you can search for that within the module system. You'll find a bunch of different versions, and each of those versions is tied to a container, and you can run your, your code at TAC using the, the containerized environment to get reproducible results. So we love it. Um, that 5,000 count is just us. Those are the containers that we built and deployed. I know a lot of our users build their own custom containers and, and run them as well. But we're huge fans. Um, there may be some 
Docker people may be familiar with. This is definitely the leader in the ecosystem as a, a runtime environment to interpret the containers, um, as well as a definition of how to build the containers. So we use that heavily here, but you can't actually run the Docker runtime on an HPC cluster because there are some security vulnerabilities. So Singularity is another container runtime that is built for a high performance computing environment. Um, it came out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, it's uh, now its own entity, Scilabs, that, that operates it. Uh, it's fantastic. We have Singularity running on all of our HPC systems. So if there is a Docker container uh, that's on the same architecture, like an x86 Docker container, you can run it on any of our x86 systems. Um, it's, it's fantastic. So essentially what containers do is, uh, like TensorFlow is a great example. TensorFlow has a ton of, it's a machine learning library, but it has a ton of dependencies. And if you have to build it from source, it's terrifying. Um, and so you can take a TensorFlow stack with all the libraries that you want, package into a container, and if you get it right once, now you can go deploy it on different systems and, and always have it available. So the container runtime is, is the only dependency. So it's really powerful for, for portability and reproducibility. And if that interests you, then you should know that Cypress has a container camp that's coming up next month uh, in March. And it's a three-day workshop that will cover a whole lot on the hands-on experience building Docker containers, building Singularity, running them on different systems. Um, you know, there's, there's time dedicated each day for kind of doing your own project and really doing a lot of experience so that you can hit the ground running after the workshop. Uh, we have other webinars that, that Cyverse has done if you look in the kind of the webinar slot or page, they're tied to containers specifically. I don't have time to dive into them today, but uh, they're more hands-on. Uh, at TAC, we frequently do container workshops as well. So if you go to that learn.tac page, you will find archive material uh, on some of the container uh, tutorials that, that we've done here. So definitely something to know about if you are developing any kind of software, doing any type of analysis where the software artifact is something you need to maintain and publish. Okay, and with that, that kind of covers the high level of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I want to thank the National Science Foundation there. It's, it's through their support that Cyrus is up and going, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, and then I want to hit a few questions. So I see that, um, that we have uh, something in chat, but Whenever you guys signed up for the class, there were also some questions that came in that I have here and want to make sure that I've covered. Um, there's a question on pricing and accessibility, as well as the operating system, et cetera. So the pricing is, is free for the end user. Uh, it's been paid for by the National Science Foundation and other, other funding institutions. Um, accessibility, I think I've covered uh, OS. Most of the operating systems that we run here are CentOS, if uh, the flavor of Linux matters but it's all, it's all Linux-based machines. Um, you connect two by SSH. And that, of course, can be abstracted out using the science APIs. Um, people asked about containers and reusable pipelines. Uh, I highly encourage the, the container camp if you're interested in that. Uh, running machine learning models uh, or deep learning models. The Lone Star 5 system at TAC, which uh, is, is fairly available, has a GPU. Um, Q with some GPU nodes, so that's a possible resource for you. There is uh, Frontera, which is a little bit harder to get access to because it's kind of a leadership class thing. Uh, and then there's also Longhorn, the systems that we run that, that are intended for machine learning. And then as far as bioinformatics programs at TAC, a lot of them are registered inside of the discovery environment. Uh, and like I said, we mirror biocontainers, which covers a whole lot of the bioinformatics space uh, so you can module load biocontainers as a module if you're, if you're on the TAC command line. And that will, it's kind of a meta module. It loads in all the different biocontainers that are available. And then you can do a keyword search for those module key in the, the app that you're interested in. Um, so I think those are the, the main questions I had. Are there any other questions online before, uh, before I sign off? Hey, John, it's Tina. Um, I typed one in just because I don't understand how it works, but if somebody wanted to access TAC HPC resources, 
do they have to specify which system they want? You had gone into good detail about what the different systems capabilities were, or is that automated via the API? Yeah, so um, whenever someone develops an app and registers it within the API, they specify which system it should run on. So for most of the apps that are in the discovery environment, uh, they are on Stampede 2 and some of them are on Lone Star 5. Um, I think there's some that are on Wrangler that are more data intensive. And the app developer was the one making those decisions. They were the human in the loop that said, these are the types of resources we need to run this app effectively. And they chose which system to deploy it on. So when you run the app within the discovery environment, it automatically runs for you on the system that the app developer chose. If you are the app developer, then you get to choose. <laughs> okay. So in a sense, it's about finding the proper, the appropriate API for what you want to do more than specifying the specific system you want to use. Right. Yeah. So if you're just consuming the APIs, then you can just look through the apps and um, you know, any of the HPC apps, and they'll have some significant resources uh, behind them. Um, if you are a developer that's building this out, then uh, you can incorporate whichever system you want. It doesn't have to be a tax system. These APIs are completely generic. Got it. So it can be any system that you want to, to use to run your app and you build an app on top of that system. Okay, okay. Um, are there any other questions for John? If so, uh, you're welcome to type them in or you can unmute sure. yourself and ask. In so the Su Susan oh. sent me a message privately that says, hi John, are there any of the HPCs available for free outside the US? So TAC very much has a global community. Um, the allocations, since they're by a U.S. funding institution, really all of them, um, they're awarded to U.S.-based researchers, um, but any collaborator globally is welcome to use those allocations. So if you are using Cyverse, right, you can be anywhere on the globe and, and run apps and things that run on our HPC resources. So that's one example where your friend in the U.S., if you will, um, but if you are directly accessing HPC and want command line access, if you have any collaborator in your space, uh, they can apply for the allocation and then add you as someone that's part of their project. Uh, and so that's how researchers outside of the U.S. get access to these NSF-funded resources. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Are there further questions? Um, all right, then. Uh, Please join us in two weeks, February 28th. The next webinar will feature PhD candidate Chris Kieft of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, who will explain and demonstrate Vibrant. It's an automated recovery and annotation tool he has developed to help identify microbial viruses that may be present in genomic sequences. Uh, to register that, for that, please go to our website and register, and um, we'll see you then in two weeks. John, thank you so very much. Happy Valentine's to everybody, and we'll see you online in a couple of weeks, I hope. Great. Thank you all.